So I'm Dr. Chris Moulin, a senior lecturer in cognitive neuropsychology. In this podcast, I'm going to talk about one of the classics of cognitive psychology, levels of processing. And I'm going to illustrate how this is an important concept even today, even though the concept is 40 years old. What I'm going to do in this podcast is start off by giving you a demonstration of the levels of processing effect. I'm not going to tell you too much about it. This is a fairly typical way that we might start a psychology lecture, is to give you an illustration of the concept that we're dealing with, a mini experiment, not with scientific controls or anything like that, but a demonstration of how we get this information. And then I'm going to talk to you about this theory and how it developed, but I'm going to give you four instances of how modern psychology has taken the concept further. So on the slide you'll see on the screen now, I want you to read each one of these words and rate it for pleasantness. One being unpleasant and five being pleasant. Don't think about it too much, just think about how pleasant each one of the words is for you. You can pause this slide while you do it. You might like to jot down on a piece of paper the pleasantness ratings, but don't. Whatever you do, write down what the words are. OK, now I'm going to give you a second slide with a second set of words. And in this case, I want you again to read the word and count the number of vowels in each word. And again, you might like to write down what the number of vowels are, or you might just want to think how many of the vowels there are and move on to the next word. But again, whatever you do, don't write down the word. OK, so now I'm going to ask you to complete these mental arithmetic sums. They're not very difficult, and there's only five of them, but have a go at solving each of them. Nobody's going to mark your answers, so it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong, but just have a go at them. OK, now what we're going to do is a surprise test. So I want you to write down as many of the words as you can remember from either of the two lists that I gave you. Now, this is a surprise test. Hopefully, you won't have known that I was going to test you and your memory, but knowing that you know that this is a psychology podcast, you probably had in mind I was going to do something like that anyway. Anyway, write down as many words as you can. Now, what you should find in the course of doing this is that you recall words more from the first list than you do words from the second list. So you might like to rewind and have a look at which words were on which list if you want to do it very, very properly. But the idea is, is that the words on the first list where you rated the pleasantness should be better remembered than the words on the second list where you only counted the number of vowels. Now the difference between those two things is the depth of processing. In one of those, you've encoded them deeply in relation to yourself, you've thought about how pleasant it is, and in the other instance, you've merely looked at the surface characteristics. You don't even really need to read a word in order to count the number of vowels in it. Now, some of this will be disrupted by the fact that if you knew it was a memory experiment, you maybe weren't too worried about the instructions that I gave you. But that's why I didn't introduce the topic before we started. I didn't say, hey, memory is illustrated by the levels of processing effect. Now, there's a few reasons why this isn't a proper memory experiment. And there are things that we've done to ensure that it's as good as possible, but this is a very strong effect. So we would expect, if I tested 100 of you, that the vast proportion of people would show better memory for the first list, the pleasant list, than the other list. But there are a number of things we need to do in order to uh, make sure in a real experiment that this would work. The first issue is incidental learning. So, as I said, if you knew what I was up to, then it might have encouraged you to learn the words in a more deliberate kind of way. So this is called an incidental learning test, where we test you with a surprise and we don't tell you beforehand that you're going to learn the information. The second issue is the effect of order. And we often look at that with counterbalancing. So naturally enough, we would expect your memory performance to be better on the second list than on the first list. And that's because the first list comes along and then you have to remember some um, information in the second list and the information encountered more recently is always better remembered. It's just common sense. That's how the way it works. The final issue is they are two different sets of words. So we would like to match as far as possible the two sets of words. It might just be that the words on the first list are more memorable than the words on the second list. So we have to control all those kinds of things. 
Nonetheless, I'm fairly confident that this demonstration would have worked. And it's a fairly robust thing in psychology that we can use in our lectures to, to help illustrate these points. Now, what we'll see here is another phenomenon. So maybe you didn't know that I was going to test your memory and you didn't understand the levels of processing effects, you hadn't read about it before. Then you might be in this camp of people who frustrate psychologists and you might be saying now, it's common sense, I knew that all along. Of course you remember better the things you process more deeply. And this is something we often encounter in psychology and one of the things that we're keen to do as psychologists to avoid that kind of conception of how psychology works. The first thing you often find in psychology is because you're dealing with human thoughts and human processes and human feelings, if you hit upon something that does make a lot of sense, you will encounter the new it all along effect. And there is research done on the new it all along effect, whereby if you train somebody on, some, on a piece of information and it is fluently processed and easily incorporated into their existing knowledge, if you ask them about it later on, they'll say they always knew it, even though it's you that have taught it to them in a specific instance. And psychologists are used to finding that with the common sense research. But let's also focus a little bit on why this study isn't just common sense. And to do that, you just have to come back to this idea that psychology is a science. We're looking to get some numbers as evidence behind these hypotheses and these suppositions. So it's not enough just to have anecdotes and people having a vote saying, yeah, I reckon there's the levels of processing effect. What we need to do if we want to be a science and considered as such is to measure these things. And of course, in measuring these things, you can provide some kind of evidence base, which is then useful to take other places. So it gives you some kind of authority. It's the evidence that gives you the authority, not the doctor or the scientist that's doing the work. It's the scientific evidence we've got. So we know that people will have better memory in a deep condition than in a shallow condition. And therefore, we can use that as information to ethically treat people with memory impairment and things like that. There really isn't too much more to say about levels of processing. It's a very robust phenomenon, as I've said. It's quite easy to replicate. You might like to have a go at designing a levels of processing experiment yourself and run it on some non-psychologists and people to see how it works. But the basic idea has been replicated in four other more contemporary kinds of research themes, which I'm going to show you now. Now, these aren't the levels of processing effect. They're usually something more than the levels of processing effect, but they're an illustration of this idea about how doing things during encoding, during learning of information, can help your retention of it later. They also hinge around this idea of using an incidental memory test. So the first of these is the generation effect. And the generation effect just says that materials you generate yourself are much better remembered than information that's presented to you by an experimenter or by somebody else. And the basic idea here is things that are internally generated are much better encoded into the processes and the, your structure and your knowledge than things that are generated by somebody else. So you're very active in the generation of, of material that you may want to remember later, whereas just passively receiving something from somebody else is not so good for your memory. The second of these would be the self-reference effect. Now, this is a really exciting effect in contemporary psychology. And in fact, it's something where the main debate was whether this was something special or whether it was, in fact, just another kind of version or another instance of the levels of processing effect. The self-reference effect works like this. I give people two lists of adjectives that describe people. So these might be adjectives like happy, sad, ugly, generous, um, forceful, aggressive, uh, timid, shy, and so on. Adjectives that describe people. I have these in two separate lists. So for one of these lists, I say to people, rate these adjectives as they reflect your personality. So relate them to yourself. So are you generous? Are you kind? Are you supportive? Are you sad? Are you mean? And so on. And you can rate them according to that. The other set of words, I say, rate them to somebody else. David Beckham, your best friend, the Queen, anybody you like. And the robust finding that we get, again like the levels of processing effect, is the material encountered with reference to yourself, when I test you with a surprise test later on, is much better retained than the information that you've processed in relation to somebody else. 
Now that's exciting not just for cognitive psychologists but for social psychologists and psychologists interested in the self because it suggests there's something powerful about the self as an organisational structure. If you relate something to yourself, you remember it better. The third of my rundown of similar effects is the enactment effect. And this is a rather similar idea. And this just says that if you give people action words, such as clap, scratch, wave, and so on, these words are much better retained if you perform the action than if you just read the word or say the word. And again, it's like the levels of processing effect in that the processing that you do during encoding leads to better memory later on. But it's not exactly the same as the levels of processing effect. My final example of something similar to the levels of processing effect is called the survival enhancement effect. I just find this quite amazing. I only just recently read about this research um, and I'd love to get involved in doing something similar myself. This effect is where you give people lists of nouns or common objects and in one condition you might rate their pleasantness or so on, which is itself we know a deep levels of processing. But in the other condition you ask the person to rate how effective it would be as a survival tool. How useful would this be if you were on a desert island and needing to survive with it? And there's also other versions of this task. But I wouldn't be telling you all this if it wasn't the fact that when you process information by answering a question, rating how likely it is to aid your survival, again, your memory for that material much later on, just on a dry verbal memory test, is much better than if you just judge its pleasantness or something else. So a bit like the self-reference uh, effect, it's a case where the information is processed in relation to something very important and therefore is much better retained later on, even though you're not on a desert island or doing anything like that. Now what psychologists have made of that is something very powerful about the evolutionary nature of memory. Of course it's really important that we do remember things that are valuable to ourself but also to our survival and so that's where possibly these effects come from. So we've taken something very dry, a laboratory experimental task, but you can see it has relevance for the real world and for the very big questions in psychology like how we evolved and why we are how we are. So in this podcast I've given you a rundown of um, the levels of processing effect which is a classic, I hope you encounter it at some point in your psychology studies and think about maybe having a go at replicating it. It's a great experiment to run because it nearly always works unless people know about it unless they're in on it. The other effects I've shown you, these are things to think about. These are ways in which psychologists are in inspired by a classic kind of experiment in the field and have a kind of a novel take on it. So we can learn something about the self by doing something like the levels of processing effect but turning it to self-referential processing. Or we can learn something about the nature of survival instincts and so on by looking at how people rate things for survival value and their, and their memory performance later on. In these instances we're using memory as a tool to understand something a bit more fundamental and a bit more like people conceive of, of psychology. So what would be a great task for you to do is to think about that. When you're reading psychological experiments don't look at just the experiment there as it is and what you have to learn from that. Think about the method used and the general approach and how that could be harnessed to answer other questions. This is the way all sciences work. There's a very basic principle which is then opened up and by standing on the shoulders of giants, as the phrase goes, you can then learn more about ever more complex aspects of human behaviour.